Hello, and welcome to All Power to the Imagination, a podcast with the non servian Media Collective. I'm Frank Miroslav, and each month I'll be doing a deep dive into a topic or piece of work from a radical perspective. While I myself am an anarchist, I want to make this podcast open to anyone and any ideas that take seriously the project of universal human emancipation. With that out of the way, let's begin. The article, Complexity Rising, From Human Beings to Human Civilization, A Complexity Profile, by Yanir Bar-Yum of the New England Complex Systems Institute, begins by talking about the connectivity of our global human civilization. They say, today, global connections are manifest in the economy, in transportation, and communication systems, and in response to political, social, and environmental crises. Sometime during the last century, a transition occurred, first to global conflict, and then to global cooperation. Along the way, the conditions of life changed, driven by technological, medical, communication, education, and governmental changes, which themselves involved global cooperation and collective action. With this setting the stage, they suggest that we can analyse this global collective behaviour as well as the internal structure of human civilizations through mathematical concepts that apply to all complex systems. Guinea suggests that based on these mathematical concepts, we can liken human civilization to an organism that can exhibit incredibly complex behaviour. Yanir suggests that the history of civilization can be characterized through the progressive appearance of more and more complex behaviors of larger groups of human beings that are more intimately connected, although he stresses that this is a non-linear process. This increase in complexity is valuable because the more complex that a system is, the more capable it is of responding to challenges. With this out of the way, he begins section two, individual and collective behavior. All macroscopic systems, whether their behavior is simple or complex, are formed out of a large number of parts. Yanir uses the example of how atoms at room temperature in a solid, liquid or gas can still move randomly at speeds of up to a thousand kilometers an hour. However, because they move over such small places, and because the atoms in nearby spaces are moving into the places that they left, the system appears to be unchanging. For a macro system to exhibit behavior that we can identify with our eyes, its individual parts must behave in a correlated fashion with each other. Systems that have parts that are completely independent of each other appear to be very simple when viewed at from a macro scale. Similarly, systems that appear complicated at a macro scale may be very simple at the micro scale. It is this coordination between individual parts that results in coherent behavior at scale. Yanir makes a distinction between three types of macro behavior, random, coherent, and complex. Random refers to systems whose individual parts are largely uncoordinated and thus do not exhibit any coherent behavior at scale. Coherent refers to systems that are tightly directed towards a particular end and can perform relatively few functions at scale. Complex refers to systems that have specialized parts and can perform many functions at scale. He uses the example of crowds, ancient armies, and corporations for examples of random, coherent, and complex behavior, respectively. This brings us to section three, complexity profile. A more systematic way of thinking about the problem of understanding collective behavior uses the concept of a complexity profile. A complexity profile focuses attention on the scale at which a certain behavior of a system is visible to an observer, or the extent of the impact it can have on its environment. Both of these are relevant to the interactions of a system with its environment. An observer can see the behavior only when the behavior is significantly large enough to affect the observer. It is here that Yanir gives us a definition of complexity. Complexity is simply the difficulty of describing a system. A good measure of this is the number of independent behaviors that a system can perform. 
A complexity profile, therefore, is a description of a system's complexity at every single scale that is relevant. Going back to the notion of random systems and correlated systems, we can see that they share inverse complexity profile. Random systems are very complex at the micro scale, while very simple at the macro scale. Conversely, coherent systems are fairly simple at the micro scale, yet are more complex at the macro scale. This brings us to complex systems. Complex systems have specialized parts and so can be complex at many different scales. Their complexity profile looks less like a mountain and more like a valley with a series of peaks at many different scales. A good example of this is an individual human. The complexity of a single cell of a circulatory system and of the human itself are all fairly high. This question of coordination at scale is of direct relevance to the next section, control and human organizations. All this discussion of coherence between parts leaves out how coherence between parts actually occurs. This is especially relevant in human organizations. In human organizations, correlation is largely achieved through control, that is to say the influencing of one person by another. Control need not be coercive, although coercion is certainly a method by with which people obtain control over others. The most straightforward solution to the problem of control is through hierarchy. In an ideal hierarchy, all decisions must be approved by a superior before they can occur. If two people want to do something and they do not share a superior, they must send messages up the chain of command until they reach a common superior who can approve their request. Such an approach to organizing is similar to the aforementioned coherent form that systems take. By constraining the behavior of each individual, you gain, in theory anyway, the capacity to perform coherent behavior at scale. However, this idealized hierarchy has weaknesses in that suppressing the agency of individuals cuts down on the amount of complexity that can occur at smaller scales. Problems that require more flexibility at a smaller scale will impede the capacity of these hierarchies to function. Furthermore, control hierarchies have an upper limit of complexity that a single individual can handle. Beyond this limit, control hierarchies become dysfunctional as the complexity of the environment that they operate in is larger than the complexity of the individual at the top. This is a problem because no system ever exists in isolation. All systems exist within a broader context. For a system to survive by preserved structure over time, it must consume energy so as to avoid its structure deteriorating. A system in this case may be an individual organism, a species, or an ecosystem. Obviously no organism can live forever, but the context it gives rise to it can survive. All systems exist within a dynamic environment that is ever-changing. For a system to survive, it must therefore react intelligently to the environment that it operates within. The environment, in this case, can also include other systems. These may cooperate or compete with our system for the limited resources that they need to survive. The process of competition and cooperation demands complex behavior. The more complex behavior you have, the more you can deal with various competitors. Likewise, more complex behavior allows you to cooperate more effectively, both in terms of what cooperation can achieve, but also in terms of making sure that there are no free riders. This means there is a minimum level of complexity that the system must reach in order to survive in a particular environment. Minimal complexity the system has to reach in order to survive is also tempered by the system's reproduction rate. Simple systems that are capable of reproducing quite quickly need not be as complex as systems that reproduce slowly. These insights also apply to human societies and organizations. They too will engage in conflict and cooperation with other societies or organizations. Given that higher complexity gives you an edge in both conflict and cooperation, there is a natural tendency for the average complexity of an entity to increase, which in turn increases the overall environmental complexity that entities operate within. Yanir then notes how in recent history we have seen an evolution from forms of organization that emphasize central control to more decentralized forms. Keep in mind that this was written in the late 90s. He gives examples like the collapse of dictatorships in Central and South America, the fall of the Soviet bloc, and the move by many hierarchical corporations to more laterally structured organizations as examples.
He explains this by sketching out a brief model of human history based on the notion of minimal viable complexity. Early human societies were relatively simple in that the number of possible actions that the society could perform as a collective were limited compared to what came later. Despite the fact that someone living in a stateless society would have more freedom than someone living in an ancient empire at around the same time, the fact that the empire could marshal more resources made it more complex at scale, which resulted in such social forms winning militarily which allowed them to spread. However, these empires were limited in how complex they could become by the capacity of the people in charge to handle complexity. However, for the Industrial Revolution, things began to change. First of all, new information technologies and new sources of energy enabled automation and faster communication, which expanded the range of behavior that an individual could take, thus making them more complex. This meant that control hierarchies could become bigger and more powerful. The complexity of individuals also increased. In ancient empires, you could get economies of scale by having countless individuals perform simple tasks over and over again. Because the tasks were so simple, they were easy to direct and manage. As we became more specialized and the range of possibilities increased, it no longer became possible to achieve such simple economies of scale. As a result, control hierarchies had to concede more and more agency to individuals. Furthermore, as society becomes more complex, as we gain more knowledge and our technologies increase, the overall environmental complexity increases. As a result, hierarchies begin to falter because they cannot keep up with the complexity demands of the environment. We are forced to move towards more networked forms so as to distribute the problem of managing complexity among many different individuals. Of course, this isn't a linear process. As we unlock new energy sources or new ways of transmitting, collecting and processing information, the complexity of individuals increases and as such, control hierarchies become stronger. But, of course, these developments can be taken up by competitors. As such, the environmental complexity will continue to increase. The final section of this paper is talking about the implications these insights have for understanding society. I will skip these and go straight to talking about the political implications that I see. You can read them yourself. First of all, I think that Yanir's model is overly simplistic. While ancient empires were certainly the most visible form of human organization when we look at the historical record, this does not mean that they were all-powerful. The capacity for control was severely limited by the extremely limited information flow at the time. We have evidence of large-scale human behavior that did not require a control hierarchy. I recommend the 2018 article, How to Change the Course of Human History by David Graeber and David Wengro for an overview of some of the recent findings in this area. Furthermore, complexity does not correlate with the capacity for a system to survive. A system may be very complex, but if its behaviors are not in any way useful to the environment that it operates within, then it will not be able to survive. The environmental complexity increases teleologically. While this might be true from a large enough time scale, this clearly isn't the case. Human civilization could collapse. We could lose all of our technological capacity and, in turn, our complexity. Or perhaps we could just go into decline. Our current complexity relies on energy resources that are, unfortunately, at the time of recording, non-renewable in the form of fossil fuels. A civilization based on a more renewable form of energy would, would be far more durable, but the transition to such is not guaranteed. Nevertheless, I think this paper is correct in suggesting that there is a correlation between the complexity of a society, its capacity to deal with problems, and the freedom of the individuals that make up that society. The more choices that we have as individuals, the more complex we are. While there is somewhat of a tension between more complexity at the individual level and more complexity at the social level, in the long run, both benefit from empowering the other. Furthermore, despite the fact I reject the teleological view of history that is implied here, I do believe that Yanir is basically correct about the fact that, on average, more complex systems win out over less complex systems, all else being equal. Also, more complex systems can make better use of resources, which in turn creates more niches for other systems to fill in. If you want to have positive sum interactions between systems, and which is basically the basis of cooperation, unique complexity. This in turn increases the overall complexity of the environment.
One example of this happening is with photosynthetic organisms that created enough oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere that other organisms could use it for energy. This increase in the availability of energy was what enabled multicellular life to sustain itself. We see analogous phenomena occur in human societies when discoveries open up new ways of acting in the world. The possibilities opened up by a new technology or a new way of doing things can reverberate far beyond the initial creator's intention. This effectively creates new behavioural niches that can be exploited. Such dynamics favour systems that can more easily adapt as opposed to ones that require a static environment in order to survive. Yanir's model also suggests a clear link between social and material freedom. It is very hard to limit that complexity without also limiting the choices that we would classify as social freedoms. Furthermore, because increased complexity means systems are harder to control, hierarchies are only capable of sustaining themselves by restricting freedom. It stands to reason that they must restrict all freedoms. Even freedoms that some deem to be non-essential, like that of sexuality or gender expression, are clearly important. If hierarchies can only deal with a limited amount of complexity, then anything that increases the complexity and makes it more difficult for that hierarchy to operate, however seemingly trivial, should not be discounted. A society's capacity to implement new ways of doing things and to experiment is limited by the restrictions it places on the individual people that make it up. So, what are the implications of this? Well, as you may have guessed, I think our current society, at least liberal democratic societies, are probably on their way out. Yanir Bayam was interviewed in a 2016 article for Vice magazine in which he said that society was too complex to have a president and that we should move towards a system of governance in which teams come together to create policy that is implemented. While I don't necessarily agree with this, I think the very concept of a nation state is problematic. I do think that we are currently in a liminal period between common sense ways of governing and organizing our society. Furthermore, I also think that authoritarianism enabled by those aforementioned improvements in energy technology, information processing, and communication could dramatically increase the capacity of control hierarchies made up of small elites to control vast populations. I don't know where we're going, but the current order is clearly insufficient for the problems that we face. This has been the first episode of All Power to the Imagination in collaboration with non-Servian media. Catch you next time.